Good morning. It's Wednesday and I am back in the Book of Acts. Um, it's an amazing book, as I've said quite often. And now we're up to chapter 21. I'm going to read the first 16 verses, or at least attempt to. And um, the church by this time is established in a lot of different places. And so as Paul and his traveling companions are moving from one place to another, they're staying with folks who are Christians, who are part of the community. And um, he is on his way to Jerusalem, which it looks like nobody's happy about. So I'm going to read these first 16 verses for you. <clears throat> oh, and remember that just um, right before this, they were in uh, Ephesus, close to Ephesus, where the leaders of that community came out to say goodbye to Paul. And he had been with them three years. So it says, and so with the tearful goodbyes behind us, we were on our way. We made a straight run to Kos, and the next day we reached Rhodes and then went to Patra. There we found a ship going direct to Phoenicia, got on board and set sail. Cyprus came into view on our left, but was soon out of sight as we kept on a course for Syria, eventually docked in a port of Tyre. While the cargo was being unloaded, we looked up local disciples and stayed with them seven days. Their message to Paul from an insight given by the Spirit was, don't go to Jerusalem. When our time was up, they escorted us out of the city to the docks. Everyone came along, men, women, children, and they made a farewell party of the occasion. We all kneeled on the beach together and prayed. Then, after another round of saying goodbye, we climbed aboard the ship while they drifted back to their homes. A short run from Tyre to Pompeia completed the virgin voyage. We greeted our Christian friends there and stayed with them a day. In the morning, we went on to Caesarea, Caesarea and stayed with Philip the Evangelist, one of the, quote, seven. Philip had four virgin daughters who prophesied. After several days of visiting, a prophet from Judea by the name of Agbis came down to see us. He went right up to Paul, took Paul's belt, and then in a dramatic gesture, tied himself up, hands and feet, and said, this is what the Holy Spirit says. The Jews in Jerusalem are going to tie up the man who owns this belt just like this and hand him over to godless unbelievers. When they heard that, we and everyone there that day begged Paul not to be stubborn and persist in going to Jerusalem. But Paul wouldn't budge. Why all this hysteria? hysteria? Why do you insist on making a scene and making it even harder for me? You're looking at this backwards. The issue in Jerusalem is not what they will do to me, whether they arrest or murder me, but what the master Jesus does through my obedience. Can't you see that? We saw that we weren't even making a dent in his resolve and gave up. It's in God's hands now, we said. Master, you handle it. It wasn't long before we handed our luggage, we had our luggage together and we're back on our way to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples in Caesarea went with us and took us up to the home of Nisan, who received us warmly as his guest. A native of Cyprus, he was among the earliest disciples. <clears throat> So we have Paul on his travels and Paul being bullheaded. And that seems to be a very consistent theme through the book of Acts. Paul is clear about his call and about what God is doing in his life. And so he is very single-minded. And what I find really interesting in this passage is there were people who were telling him not to go to Jerusalem. It was dangerous for him to go to Jerusalem. I think this is why, and I'm pretty sure that as we read into the book of Acts, we'll find um, more evidence, was that Paul was the disciple apostle who was opening this new reform movement within Judaism. Again, we remember that Christianity really started, well, of course it started with Jesus who was Jewish, and there were a number of, um, a number of people who wanted to keep it within the confines of the Jewish faith. And so although you could make this additional, 
Hey, Winona, you can make this additional um, commitment to the Messiah that God had brought for the Jews. You still were Jewish. You were still Jewish through and through. And yet Paul consistently and through a broad swath of the world welcomes anyone who believes, whether they're Greek or whether they're Roman or whether they're just people who have never believed in anything at all. And he has with, um, we remember the Council of Jerusalem, with the leaders of the church said, you don't have to become Jewish. You don't have to follow all the Jewish laws. You don't have to be circumcised. You simply need to believe that Jesus is the son of God and the one who has come to save us. Now, for those of us in this generation, we think that this isn't a big deal. That of course, Christians are separate from Jewish folks. And of course, we've made different ways of um, our faith journeys into God's relationship with God. But this is still the first century and it is not a given that you could believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah and not keep all of the Jewish rules and laws and become Jewish yourself. So that being said, the folks in the church in Jerusalem are believers in Jesus Christ, but the majority of those folks were Jewish when they were raised. And so for those folks, um, many of them are upset that Paul is opening the church wide to anyone who wants to believe. The church has consistently had this issue again and again and again. Who is included and who is not? Um, from the folks in Jerusalem and those Jews who first believed that Jesus Christ was the Son of God and becoming people of faith as Christians, it was Jewish folk. It was folks who, if you weren't Jewish, at least you were keeping all of the Jewish law. And for Paul, it is anyone who believes and wants to become uh, a person in relationship through the life and death of Jesus Christ. And so they sit at very different places. And Paul, I believe, wants to go back, although Again, I don't know exactly, but it seems as though Paul wants to go back to Jerusalem to make a point that he is a leader in the church as much as anyone else, even though the people that he is inviting in are not really welcomed by um, so many folks who are in the Christian church. I don't know if any of that made any sense, but the question since Christ died for us on that first Easter morning is, who is in and who is out? Who gets invited into relationship with God and who does not? And what are the requirements for being in relationship with God through Jesus Christ? From Paul's perspective, it is anyone who believes. From many, many churches' perspectives and from the folks who were in Jerusalem, there's a whole lot of gates to go through, a whole lot of hurdles to jump, a whole lot of rules to follow before this welcome is really made for you. And for those of us who believe that um, all we need to do is believe in Jesus Christ, I also would challenge you to think um, who we kind of sanction as Christians along with us. So the other thing I want to point out is not only are people through the Holy Spirit and through again, um, this understanding. I mean, one of the men is a prophet and he says, through the Holy Spirit, I want to tell you what's going to happen. Paul, as you go into Jerusalem, what's going to happen is they're going to tie you up and they're going to hand you over to uh, unbelievers, which is probably Roman authorities, which is in fact what happens, but spoiler alert. And so, Paul, I think, was very much aware that if he went into Jerusalem, his life was in danger. That was the given. But then again, Jesus had known that if he went into Jerusalem, that Passover um, that he did, that his life was in danger. And so again, for Paul here, he says, that's not the point. The point is not whether or not my life will be in danger. The point is not whether or not I might get arrested or beaten up. 
The point is that I will be faithful to what God is calling me to do. And um, not that God calls people to go into dangerous situations just to make a point or just to get beaten up. But Paul had good news to tell those who were limiting the church to people they felt comfortable with. The people they felt comfortable with to become Christians were those who were Jewish and had lived a good and faithful Jewish life. And those good and faithful Jews had waited for the Messiah that God would bring into the world. And they were um, encouraged, uh, asked to believe that Jesus of Nazareth was that man. And as they came to believe, then they became Jews who became Christians, who became the foundation of that early church. And that was who Paul was. Paul was a faithful Jewish man who had had a revelation and understanding of Jesus Christ and had become a Christian. So that's the early church. And they are upset with Paul because Paul has been traveling far and wide and invited everyone in, no matter who they are, no matter what their former life was like, and is not requiring that they follow the Jewish law, is not requiring that they have the sign of Judaism, which is circumcision. We've talked about what circumcision is. And he is saying that all you need to do is believe that Jesus from Nazareth became the Christ, became the one who was our way into a special and forgiven and whole relationship with God. And it led to healing and eternal life in that um, loving relationship that God offered us through Jesus. And so people aren't happy about that. <laughs> people are not happy <clears throat> in Jerusalem that Paul is welcoming everyone. But again, consistently true in who we are as people of faith. We want to make rules and limits upon who God welcomes and who God doesn't. And so this is Paul and Luke, because we have, again, that uh, plural noun of we, and this is what we're doing, and um, as we are on our way, our luggage got ready. So Luke is among them in this traveling portion of the book of Acts, and they are going from the outskirts of Ephesus to Jerusalem. And next week, when we pick up, we'll see what happens with Paul in Jerusalem as he again, very stubbornly, bullheadedly, will follow what he believes God is calling him to do. So on this day in April, when it's colder than we want it to be, at least we don't have snow, um, just continue to know that God's calling to you too, to be loving and kind, to continue to live in the example of Jesus Christ, who told us that we should love one another as he has loved us, and continue to see Paul's incredible journey of faith and stubbornness, quite frankly. So it's okay, as long as it's connected to God and what God can do through our lives. Blessings and peace on this day. Good to talk with you.